Welcome to the Rethink Leadership Podcast with me, Jeremy Blaine, CEO of Performance Works International. This podcast is grounded in business, digital, workforce, and leadership transformation for our times. My aim is to initiate conversations with experts, leaders, professionals who've got a story to tell and who we can all learn from. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel or simply go to performanceworks.global to access all the episodes to date. I'm sure you'll find something of interest. Joining me today from the New York State Police is Captain Robert Appleton. He's Captain of Troop G for the Bureau of Criminal Investigation and is a mission-driven and innovative leader with over 25 years of experience in law enforcement. He's experienced in strategy, operations and tactics, organizational diagnosis and interventions, the design and facilitation of large-scale events, meetings, and is committed to leadership development activities. Over his impressive career, Rob has developed strong strategic planning, leadership and facilitation skills through effective communication across all levels internally and through a passion in supporting the communities within which he and his team serve externally. We discuss the leadership and community challenges facing law enforcement today and how a collaborative, multi-force approach to leadership and empowering action at all levels in all areas have paid dividends. This episode is in aid of the First Responders Children's Foundation, Rob's chosen charity of choice, to which we have made a contribution as a thank you to Rob for joining us. The foundation provides financial support to children who have lost a parent in the line of duty, as well as families enduring significant financial hardship due to tragic circumstances. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Rethink Leadership podcast with me, your host, Jeremy Blaine. It's great to have Captain Robert Appleton with us today. Rob, thanks very much for joining us. Please introduce yourself, your long family history in policing, and a brief overview of your impressive career in the New York State Police and, of course, your continuing passion for what the police stand for and their role in the future. Well, thank you very much, Jeremy. I, I, I appreciate the opportunity and the honor of being on your podcast. Um, right now, I'm the BCI captain uh, for Troop G, and I'll explain what that is. Um, I'm in charge of the Bureau of Criminal Investigation for Troop G, which is the 10 counties uh, around the Capital Region in upstate New York. I've been on the job for about 26 years. I've done a little bit about everything um, on the job. It has been incredible from you know, when you first start out, you start out on the street as, you know, as a street cop, as a trooper, um, worked in a couple of different troops um, on the road, eventually made my way to investigator, uh, became shortly after 9-11. We had a contaminated crime scene emergency response team. I did that for a while. I led the Hank Williams Homicide Seminar, which is an international homicide seminar where we have uh, homicide detectives from all over the world come and gather here once a year. Um, so I ran that for nine seminars, um, and it's still going today. It's, a, it's an incredible program. I made my way to, um, after that, I went to internal affairs for 497 days. Not that I was counting. That's a tough job. Uh, and then after that, I went to computer crimes for a couple of years. And I, I was the, um, the task force commander for the New York State ICAC task force, which is the Internet Crimes Against Children task force, for a couple of years. And then I went out to the field to be a BCI lieutenant. Um, And now um, I'm the BCI captain after, um, you know, that's now I'm here. Um, I'm in charge of 19 senior investigators, approximately 90 um, investigators. Uh, We have a civilian staff. Uh, It's just an incredible, incredible group of people that I get to work with every single day. And we get to work on the most high profile, the most complex, um, some of the most harrowing and and, uh, disturbing cases that you can possibly imagine. And we have a group of people that just does an incredible job. Um, you asked me to introduce a little bit about my upbringing. My father was a 34-year veteran of the Massachusetts State Police. Uh, that's where I grew up. Uh, my mom was an ER nurse for a while, and um, she ended up uh, going to school for anesthesia. So she was a practicing nurse anesthetist for for a long time. Um, and and so what that meant for me and my brother at home was we couldn't get away with anything. Right. So my mom and dad, either in the ER 
uh, where the hospital and, and police officers, they kind of see the same people. Um, they hear the same stories. And uh, so my brother and I never had a chance. <laughs> uh, but our upbringing was fantastic. Um, obviously, it was, uh, you know, service to others before self. Um, you know, that's they sent me to a military school at Norwich University. It's the oldest private military college in, in the United States. Um, has a tremendous leadership reputation. Uh, and that's kind of where my leadership uh, affinity or my um, admiration of really solid leaders really took hold was at, was at Norwich. And then since then, and I graduated there in 1992, went on to get my master's in 2008. But really, Norwich has really started my infatuation with leadership, what good leadership does and how it produces incredible results. And then on the other side, it also where leadership failures um, really are detriment to things. And, um, and right now, uh, in public service, uh, leadership is extremely important. And so you want to be able to do it right. So I study it often. And luckily enough, uh, we've had some leadership development through our organization in the New York State Police. I've attended a lot of leadership courses, both through Marist and through the job. And just through networking with folks um, has got me to where I am now. I mean, I did not get here by myself at all. Uh, there are a lot of people who have a hand in my career. And I can't tell them enough um, how much I appreciate that. Um, so that in a nutshell is is me. Wow, you you absolutely have done everything, didn't you, Rob? Uh, from county to state, right through to kind of this this global team that you're still involved with as well. And uh, I hadn't quite quite realized that you've been involved in all of those different departments, too. And uh, the point that you were making just then around leadership, that's what got us connected through a leadership network, of course. And it's been a pleasure to get to know you a little bit. And I want to deep dive into that then right now, perhaps. And really in your line of work as well, get under the skin of what is the biggest challenge that law enforcement faces today? And how does the impact, particularly the communities within which you serve, the force itself and, of course, the senior level who are leading the response? Well, that's it's actually a multifaceted question because to pinpoint it to one particular thing uh, that would make our job easy. Unfortunately, it's fairly complex. But the biggest challenge we face right now is the gun violence in the street, uh, which is you know, exacerbated by the drug culture and, and the drug problem that we have uh, in this country. Um, and then you have to, it's compounded with the fact that there's a, a severe mistrust between the community and law enforcement right now that we're trying to rebuild. Um, you have some other political factors in, in play that sometimes make things more difficult in the fighting amongst our, our two-party system here. Um, so there's a lot going on in this country. So to say what's the biggest challenge, it's really the the safety of our people. That is the number one challenge. And, and really, that's our mission, right? At the end of the day, is we want to keep people safe. That's really what we're here for. Um, and there's just a lot of serious challenges um, that either allow or don't allow us to do that as well as we could from time to time. That's very interesting to me, because as you said that, the safety of our people, I flicked immediately into business and thinking, wow, isn't that a great statement for leaders in our businesses today as well? Fast moving, unpredictable, uncertain, anything can happen. And we need a place where our people can flourish. Uh, so our business communities, as much as the communities go. And, and I know that from a business perspective, then bringing a lot of moving parts together is um, really can start to help that from a leadership perspective, a management perspective, and et cetera. So when you consider keeping your people safe, keeping people safe as a police force, how do you go about diagnosing the things that are getting in the way of that, the key problems, the challenges that you see, and how do you collaborate across kind of multiple forces as a winning strategy to go forward? Well, as I was talking a little bit before, in, in our own personal leadership, we all realize, or most of us should realize, that we didn't get to where we are alone. Um, the same thing with with policing, um, intelligence-led policing in, in particular, is that there's no one agency that has all of the resources. So between our federal partners, the state partners, um, our local and county partners, um, each one of us has kind of a piece to that puzzle. And when you can embrace the fact that 
no one of us, not a single person or a single agency is the solution. What it takes, and it's absolutely imperative, is a collaborative approach. Um, some of the challenges are is that, you know, there's agency pride and there was some, some old territorialism that, that took place between agencies that didn't allow for that great communication. As you can probably see, sometimes see in business, if, if I'm going to draw a parallel, imagine if, you know, Microsoft and Apple and all the computer companies were asked to collaborate on a, on a problem and, and they were to do it together. There was no competition. The thing is, is they were there to solve a problem. So that's what we do is we take different agencies who have very similar missions and try and figure out a way to come together to piece together this, this puzzle we're trying to, to figure out, which is public safety, um, and, and come up with a key solution that works. Uh, but as you said, it's extremely dynamic. Uh, it, it's There's a terminology used by a, a pilot. It's called the OODA loop. It's called orient, observe, orient, decide, and act. And our ability to come together and to go through that loop as quickly as we can helps us come up and face these challenges. Because as soon as you start to address the challenges, it kind of changes a little bit. The names change, people come in and out of prison, get involved in the system. Um, same thing within agencies. There's turnover within agencies. There's leadership turnover, um, promotions, retirements, sometimes terminations. Um, so sometimes the group you started out with isn't the group that you're gonna have towards the end. So there are some inherent issues with that as you would have with business some people move on sometimes they go to other companies so you have to have buy-in from the team buy-in from the community but the clear most important thing you have to have is clarity of mission have to have that you have to know what it is you're trying to solve and then you bring all these people together because at the end of the day no matter how big or small the agency is they have value sometimes the street cop from the smallest agency might have the key piece of information that you need in order to succeed. And that has to be vetted. It has to go through an intelligence. Now, one of the other things that we have is we have intelligence centers. In New York State, we have the New York State Intelligence Center, which is the overarching intelligence center for the state. In our region, though, we also have what's called the Capital Region Crime Analysis Center. And they have agencies buy in and they have agencies embedded in the intelligence center. And that's how we share information. So each agency will participate. The, the key is, is the intelligence centers are only as good as the information that we can put into them. So they have to participate. Then they conduct the analysis, give us the information that we need so we can drive intelligence led policing. So we're not just nefariously or wastefully using resources and just using a shotgun approach method where we're trying to just to cover everything. We don't have the resources to do that. We have to surgically kind of go in and find where the intelligence is and lead us to the problem rather than over-policing everybody, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, Rob. And so much, again, there are so many synergies across business and you make the, the strong point around those computer companies. Wouldn't that be amazing if all those companies got together to collaborate to solve big problems for, for people, for the world, for society? But there's a lot of things that you talk about there that will resonate as well it's the clarity of mission clarity of direction the communication that falls from that how we collaborate and i love the point you make about the 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 cop on the beat who actually might have the missing key that all level contribution is so important and that kind of empowered approach to policing is uh, is fundamental to success and the other thing that you talk about which uh, pricked my ears up was intelligence led policing data driven being really understanding of what that gives you to allow you to make the right decisions at the right time across the forces as well um and and it's very true what you said very at the beginning as well is that you've got all of these things that you know can work very well but of course often these things can fall down in the implementation of the plan because it sounds great on paper doesn't it but you've got like you said pride territorialism different styles it's a bit fluid some people come in and out all of those kind of things so you know with all of those moving parts and all those different perspectives you've got to be careful not to fail when you're implementing the plan uh, i mean particularly in policing of course so how did you and the rest of the multi-force leaders, let's say, who are involved in a lot of these collaborative um, projects or task task forces that you lead, bring the right people on board 
um, within all of those forces, secure support within the local communities and ensure successful execution of the plan or the investigation ongoing through open communication, but firm action. Well, there's a, there's a lot that takes place there. Um, the, 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 the very key part, just to start, is that when the agencies get together, the leaders have to agree, right? We have to show that we're in it together. Because if we all buy in, then guess what? Our people are going to buy in. They're like, hey, listen, well, they're doing it. Hey, and they're with us. It, it, it's, a, it's a team building kind of commitment. And, and when we show that commitment by being present, by being there, by being involved, you can get buy-in from your people. This does not work without buy-in from your people because they're different agencies. They work for different people. But if the people that they work for are bought in, they kind of almost have no choice but to buy in, if that makes sense. Um, so that that's the first thing. Um, we all have to get together and agree on what things look like, how we're going to act, what we're going to do, who's going to do what. So there aren't any issues that come up because, as you mentioned before, issues do come up. Um, and then you have to nip those things right in the bud. Um, because most of the issues that come up usually are communications oriented. That is the biggest downfall for all of us is communication. Somebody thought that someone else was going to do something or something else was left on the table. And then the finger pointing starts and, and, and that's all very destructive process. So to get rid of that is, is clarity of your mission, knowing what everybody's supposed to do. And then when you say you're going to do something, you do it. That's how you build trust. And then once the team is all trusted, then then you have to build the bridge, like you mentioned, with the community, the community that we're serving. You actually have to go out to the community. You have to meet face to face. There has to be a personal connection because at the end of the day, our communities who uh, trust us to be able to provide this blanket of safety for them, they're involved. They're an equal partner in this. We rely upon their information. Um, there are times we're going to ask them for information or to point out who's involved. And sometimes there's some some real fear there for retribution amongst the community members themselves. So we all get to leave sometimes when we're in these areas, operating in these areas, and, and they have to stay there. So, so some really real fears that we have to overcome and some challenges that we have to overcome when building these bridges with the community. Uh, because without the community, we're just not going to be as successful. We're not going to get the information that we need. And I was telling you before with intelligence-led policing, the information that we get is only as good as the information we put in or that we're able to obtain. Um, and then you mentioned selection of key people um, that are a part of any task force um, or any problem when you get a group of agencies together to, to address an issue. You need to find your best. You can't just have someone who's just along for the ride. You need contributors. And contribution at the end of the day is most important because, again, I was telling you, even with our interagency relationships, sometimes we have what's called a blue-gray patrol where a trooper will ride with a member of another agency. And the reason why it's called blue-gray is because in New York State Police, we typically wear gray uniforms. And a lot of agencies in the state typically wear blue. I mean, that's what most people traditionally you know, align themselves when they see police as a blue uniform. So. Blue gray patrols, if you don't have people who are willing to get along and without buy-in, again, it derails the process and it can undermine the mission, which is unacceptable. So key selection of good people, buying with mission, connection with your community, which would, in your case would be, you know, your customers, because um, really that's what they are. They're our customers and they rely upon us. And, and quite frankly, they pay us through taxes. It's also kind of funny because we pay our own salaries, but that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother argument <laughs> for a whole nother day. But um, so really that's how we form these teams and it's how we address problems is, is, is going through those steps. How you started there, Rob resonates with me hugely. You talked about the consistency at leadership level, the alignment and the commitment there that really drives the whole thing. It's something I bang on about also in business a lot because it just doesn't happen as often as you would think or believe that it that it does and this is often where things fall down uh because then different behaviors politics start to rise and all of those kind of things um and something else that resonated was you being committed as leaders to this there's something that 
something about having your eyes to the sky on the big picture, but having your feet firmly on the ground where your people can see mm -hmm. you makes a massive difference, doesn't it? I think from uh, absolutely from perspective. Yeah. Um, yeah. You can't be, a, you can't be a leader strapped to a desk. If you're strapped to a desk and you're a finger pointer, um, it, it just doesn't create the buy-in. And, and, and here's the thing with, with most leaders, you, you have to be genuine. You can't come out there and come up with all these slogans and sayings and all this other kind of stuff. And then just sit from behind the desk and just magically expect it to happen. Um, it sounds good that we're talking about that. Hey, we just do these things and it all works. It doesn't, it takes a lot of effort all the time from everybody involved. And, um, this is not easy at all. So. Yeah, I can, I can understand that. And, but the things that you do by driving that communication through clarity of mission, uh, the blue and blue and gray ride togethers, getting this kind of collaborative spirit going, all of that starts to glue glue things together. I can I can start to see that, um, and it feels like that that is being role modeled very well from the very top. So all of that they're looking up and say, well, they're doing it. So I think we better start getting on and doing it as well. But even with that foolproof plan of course particularly with all of the moving parts that you're dealing with rob and the external forces in the community things can go wrong or not as you expect and of course you've got enough on your plate and there's so many things that need to be dealt with so as much as reducing the hierarchical burden on yourselves how do you reduce that on others to ensure kind of better, more empowered problem solving on the ground by the people that you've chosen, you know, to kind of get out there and um, and sort the task or the investigation so that they can, they are the ones that can get things back on track, share practices up the line as well, so that you keep your eye on that big prize as well. Well, I think the, the key thing there is, I was telling you about selecting the right people, but once you select the right people, you have to trust them to do their job. Um, they're there for a reason. Uh, if the leaders are doing uh, every person's job, so let's just say if your leader in this particular task is a captain, if they're having to do the lieutenant's jobs and the sergeant's jobs and the troopers or the police officer's jobs, then nobody's doing anything. There's only one person doing it. And as I mentioned before, nobody can do this alone. If you're going to select people for those roles, you have to allow them to do their jobs. Does that mean things are going to go swimmingly all the time? No. Uh, there's teachable moments and even the top person messes up from time to time. But then you have to own that. You have to find out what the issue is and then you have to correct it immediately. Um, and then you were mentioning empowerment. Um, again, that goes with the selection process and allowing them the some creative freedom a little bit, obviously within the rules, because we have a lot of rules that we have to operate under. But they know how to get the job done. They're the closest to the issue. The higher up you go, you're a little bit further removed from the actual problem. So even though you have experience, you might not have today's experience or yesterday's experience. Your experience might be 10 years ago. I mean, to be honest, I've been on the job 26 years this month. The last time I was actually patrolled the road was 19 years ago. So the patrol car even itself has changed quite a bit. So even though I have an understanding and the concept of what they're supposed to do in the actual intimate day-to-day -day knowledge, the minutia of the actual job, a sergeant or someone who's their first line supervisor is obviously going to be a little bit more closely related to and have a little bit better understanding and, and a better position to actually supervise that person than someone who's at the 25,000 foot view. Does that make sense? So you have to trust your people to do their job. Another thing that has to happen when things do go wrong, if there's a problem on our end, so let's just say there's a, there's a mistake that we made. First of all, we have to own up to it and then we have to fix it. And if that means removal of a person because they're going to be toxic to the situation or they're not going to be part of the solution, then you have to be willing first to acknowledge it, fix it, and then whatever that solution happens to be. If it's removal or we have to add more people or figure something else out, that's what you have to do. Um, and then, you know, and then you continue to get buy-in from the community to see what's working, what's not working, um, and being honest and transparent as much as you can. Yeah, I I like that. Own it, understand it, correct it, do it at speed so that you're not putting any more blockers in the way of that. Um, and you're so right, going back to something you initially said, selecting the right people and building that trust, that strong foundation of trust 
open communication, which you talked about before as well, just so important. And I can see you've made so much progress in this and it's uh, it's great. I'm gosh, it's like I'm, I'm sat here thinking, gosh, I'd love to join this team. It's like, it sounds fantastic. <laughs> Never mind as a leader. It's like, let's let's join as a team. And, you know, in teams like that, that are working well, you've got the multi-force approach. You've got the structure that works to build trust, open communication, collaboration, empowerment momentum is absolutely key because with change you talked about it before as well with changes of personnel you can kind of lose a bit of that momentum as well but that's where often the best leaders and management teams or multi-force teams come into their own because they understand this so with you as a, if you like a multi-team leadership um in place uh, let me call it that or a multi-task mm -hmm. force leadership in place what has been your role to support that kind of more empowered problem solving, sharing decisions on the ground so that people feel that they can do it openly without fear of being criticized, disciplined, and can make more rapid progress, even if there are times when they mess up a little bit as well. Well, again, you want a diversity of perspective, right? And in order to get information from, you know, our, our, our lower levels, and, and I don't like to say lower levels because they're 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 the most important people on our job. Um, they're the face uh, that people see when they pick up the phone and call, right? And they call nine one one. So really, they're 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 our highest level of people um, and the most important to us. Um, the the key to maintaining momentum is is you have to show that daily commitment you have to be there have that connection with them um never lose or wane in your enthusiasm for what it is that you're trying to accomplish um and then you have to show that consistency yeah you, you have to be there um not only th when things go well but when things don't go so well uh be there to support them um you know when mistakes are made you, you know you punish in private and you praise in public um and and you treat them with respect um, at the end of the day, sometimes if you make a mistake that's bad enough, hey, uh, there's going to be a punishment that that comes of it, um, or sometimes even a removal from the situation. Um, there are other times where they're teachable moments, but then you have to teach them, and then you have to be able to move on and still allow them to do their job. I mean, we're all human. Again, we make mistakes, so we have to have that compassion, not only for um, um, the community, but we also have the compassion for our own people, because at the end of the day, this is a difficult job that we're asking them to do. Um, these are not ideal conditions, but they're still here. So that says something in and of itself, and, and that has to be cherished because even though that we're paid professionals, they're still volunteering. Nobody says they have to be a police officer. No one says they have to, to join up. So they're doing it really of their own volition. Um, and that's a pretty special thing, uh, especially today, because people know how challenging it is to be a police officer. People know that the police aren't viewed necessarily as the best. And yet they still come because of the public service motivation, because they really want to help others. It's not about us. It's about the people that we work for. And um, and particularly in the BCI, you know, we, we have these conversations in our meetings often. And I remind people often, you don't really work for me um, or the colonel up at division headquarters. You work for the victim. That's who we work for. And if our perspective is right, we'll meet our mission when we keep that mentality that we're here for the people, you're not here for ourselves. And we have a dynamic team that is able to embrace that. And we still get people who sign up and want to be a part of that. And it is a pretty special thing. And that needs to be cultivated. That just doesn't happen on accident. And so when you do have something that's special, you have to take care of it. That's, that's our biggest burden right now. Uh, in any law enforcement, your leaders have to take care of the people who want to go take care of others because it's so special. That take care of your people who are the ones that want to take care of others. Fantastically put. And there's one word that as you were talking comes out, that's just shouts out respect, mutual respect, respect for the victim, for respect for each other, respect for what you're doing and respect for the care for the community that we have. Um, as it's, it's more a vocation, isn't it? Than a job really from, from one point of view the passion to be there. And that makes it under that lens of respect from what you said at the beginning there, it makes it even more important to deal with the situations when things are going wrong or like you say, things might 
that people might have to be removed from the situation, doing it in the right way with that same respect, because they're still passionate, it just might not be quite a fit there. I love that. Mm -hmm. So the logical next question for me then, Rob, on that is with the shoe on the other foot. So how do you how do leaders in the force um, and particularly across the multi force approach that, that you have there? How do you catch people doing it right? Um, let's forget the, the wrong bit. So managing those good times, celebrating the good things. What happens in the police force in terms of recognition and reward? I'm, I'm, I'm not really aware of that. OK, so it, it, very similarly, how you catch people doing it right is when you're out there with your people, you get to observe it firsthand. Um, you also have your first line supervisors and your other supervisors and your officers should also be reporting the same. Um, we're not just looking for people to screw up. Uh, we need to acknowledge when people are doing it right, because in all honesty, you're not going to get that from anywhere else. Too often. Every once in a while, you might see a feel good story on the news. But how often do you see that? You really don't. So, again, acknowledgement for a job well done is really intrinsic to the organizations. We have to find a way to do that for ourselves because, hey, listen, we all like to be told we're doing a good job. But if you never hear it, you kind of wonder. What am I doing this for? A am I? Am I fulfilling the mission? How do you know? A and a performance evaluation once or twice a year doesn't really cut it. You know, if, if I find out in June, okay, I'm doing a great job, but maybe I'm not doing such a great job between July, August, and September. By the time my next go around comes around, I, I, I might not be doing so well. So it has to be consistent, respondent feedback um, when people are doing great and, and, and equally when they're not doing so well. Um, so how it works for us is we have uh, a daily, it's called a, a POF, a performance observation form where someone can fill out, okay, in, in these categories, we have a performance evaluation form and, and there's certain categories where performance is measured. And I'll say in these categories, you did an exceptional job today in this case, and you'll have this form and you get to sign it. And uh, first line supervisor and personal, you know, it'd be, it's kind of a feel good moment, but at least there's a, um, a written form of documentation that says that those can be used in your performance evaluation. You build up enough of those when they do your evaluation, they look at. There's also things called letters of commendation. Letters of commendation are written at different levels. And those for us in the New York State Police are typically written by officers. So the assistant zone commanders, the zone commanders, which are our captains and BCI captains like myself, the major is the troop commander. A troop commander's letter of accommodation is, is, is a pretty important thing, and it's, it's a pretty special thing to have in your in your personnel jacket. And then it goes all the way up to division, um, ultimately with the superintendent's commendation. Superintendent's commendation is award. Uh, it's a decoration you actually wear in uniform, and it's a big deal. Um, acts of heroism are something completely different. Those are, you know, um, like Congressional Medal of Honor kind of things. But for us, our Congressional Medal of Honor is called the Brummer Award, and that's for acts of heroism. And those are awarded once a year. Um, sometimes uh, different troops and agencies, they'll have their own awards dinners uh, on, on an annual basis where they'll recognize the work of the previous year of the people, bring them up and bring their families, and we'll celebrate that because their families um, and their support structure at home is very much a – a reason why they're able to do so well at work. So we also celebrate the families and the people who support them at home um, and their spouses, um, because being the spouse of a trooper um, or anybody in law enforcement is a very difficult proposition. Um, I don't need to tell you that, you, you know, divorce rates amongst people in public service industries are unfortunately extremely high. Um, sometimes they don't realize what they're getting into and it's very tough. And I can tell you right now, my wife, uh, is is been with me the whole time. It's been a very special thing. As you probably saw, we did the, the weight of the badge video with George Strait. Um, and I actually learned a lot during that process. Um, it, it was, it was eye-opening for me. So that's how we get a, a chance to celebrate and catch people doing it right. It's, there's a, I'm, I'm sorry, there was a lot in there, but it starts really at the, the station and the sergeant level and it can work all the way, it's way up right to the top. Um, annual meetings and sometimes there's informal get togethers as well. Sometimes that they celebrate either a big case or things like that. We will do that. So that's how we do it. You know, I've been writing furiously as you've been uh, talking here, Rob, because there's so yeah, many. Yeah, I'm sorry. I speak a little quickly sometimes. So no, it's because of your ideas, not the speed of what you're talking about, because there's, you know, it's really clear that 
from a business perspective as well, there is definitely a movement to move away from performance management in its traditional sense and appraisals mm. in its traditional sense, because it doesn't cut it, like you said, once a year or twice a year, um, to, to something called performance support, which is, you said it just earlier, you said being out there on the job to catch them doing it right or helping them with things that they might be finding difficult. So it becomes a constant but then having the right recognition mechanisms in place, it's still actually in its infancy in in the more creative ways that we can do this thing in business. I, I mean, I know and I've heard, of course, of the letters of commendation in the military and the police, all of those things. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, why don't we do something like that? And why don't we have something special that people have on their desk or something that they wear or uh, something on their zoom background even you know that kind of has a little emblem that they've had that um so lots of ideas you give me there and some some really um instructive words for business leaders to think to think of so i hope you're ready for this now rob because we come to the sixty four thousand dollars question <laughs> yeah can I, can I just add one thing Is, you yeah about please please you know it's kind of odd and i have to kind of give a little plug to my brother he works for a company called Mequilibrium. And that's what their company does. They they go to other organizations, and and I would love to be able to do that in public industry. Um, and they talk about performance metrics and and recognizing your employees, and they have some wonderful ideas. Um, he so we talk about this a lot, and I'm like, okay, well, how can I figure this out to do something similar to this? Because they have some pretty some pretty neat ideas on how to recognize employee performance, um, and a part of that is part of retention. And there's a whole bunch of data analytics and things like that that go into it so the company can know the temperature of the morale of the people that work for them, which is a pretty cool thing. Um, if you knew, you know, hey, this is a down week. Well, why is that? And you have some data to be able to drive some of those decisions. What a great idea. Um, so, you know, so I borrow some ideas from him to try and, and implement um, for us because – at the end of the day, you can't just tell your people how important they are to you with just a couple of words. Hey, you're great. We value you, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, at the end of the day, where's the beef? You know, where, where, where's the actual interaction? Where's the actual acknowledgement? So you, you have to, um, you have to go out of your way because they deserve it. They deserve every single bit of it. They certainly do. So you heard it here first, folks. Mequilibrium. That's right, Rob. Yeah. Mequilibrium. Right. Is that your yep. brother's business? Sounds great. And in fact, there is all there's a similar business that that uh, that I work with uh, called My Social Pulse, and they do a lot of what's called sentiment research. It's quite new on the on the emotional resonance of people within business, very much around what you're talking about, the attraction, the retention uh, of staff as well, not necessarily linked to rewards or recognition, but actually understanding why there might be a down week. Um, what's our reputation like? You know, we are, after all, in. I don't I don't know what it's called these days. It's the it's been the great resignation, the great rehire, mm. the great re something anyway now. And now now people are quiet quitting as well. So there's lots of new things coming out. These kind of metrics from firms like Equilibrium, et cetera, I think are really, really important. It's it's being exactly what you talked about at the beginning, being data driven uh, a, a little bit more. So I'm going to come to you now, Rob. So I said this is the sixty four thousand dollar question for you, and I'd love to hear from you. What are the leadership and management lessons that you've learned through your journey? Um, and particularly linking back to business, what could business leaders learn from the more collaborative, communication-centered, empowered approach that that you in the forces there seem to be role modeling? Well, the biggest leadership lesson for me is that nobody does this alone. Um there isn't one person that has all the answers. There's some people who have more answers than others. Um, there are some people who are more skilled than others. But there isn't one person that I've met yet that has the all-encompassing silver bullet solution to these issues. It takes a collaborative approach. And part of that is even, even as gifted as any one of us may be, there's somebody out there who's smarter, faster, but more importantly, there's somebody out there that can offer you a different idea, a different approach that maybe you haven't thought of alone. So when you form yourself a really good team, it becomes very formidable. Um, you can't be beat uh, when you have diversity of direction, diversity of opinion. 
diversity of skill, most importantly, diversity of skill is, is critical. Um, and, and how you foster that is creating a safe space where everybody can kind of put their best forward without worrying about, Hey, am I embarrassing myself? Um, you know, am I going to be picked on for this? Cause the law enforcement culture can be, can be tough. <laughs> You know, um, it, it, we, we have a tendency to pick on people. We always said, if, if you've got a thin skin, being in law enforcement really isn't for you. Um, but the other side of it is, if you're being picked on, uh, you're also, um, you're loved. At least that's what they've always told me. Um, but anyways, um, so the lesson is being humble, being accepting, um, being collaborative, and, and putting your hat in your hand. I mean, at the end of the day, the, the mission is greater than any one of us. And if you can embrace that and and they can and that resonates amongst the group, then you'll get that buy-in. You'll get that consistency. And more importantly, because they know that this is something greater than all of us, if everybody can buy into this is greater than all of us, then then the machine just starts to take place and people start to think and then they start to add. And then we start to tweak things as we start to implement things and, and say, okay, this isn't going well. And we don't have to worry about egos or territories or politics. Um, and those things do interject themselves from time to time. And you're not going to be able to stop that. But your ability to be able to adapt um, and change on the fly is going to really dictate how successful you're going to be in anything. I don't care what line of work you're in. Your ability to adapt and overcome to some of these small things that can fester into big things by creating an environment that's trustful, that's collaborative, where people feel they're valued. Um, and I'm telling you, at the end of the day, that's what most people want. They just want to know that they're valued, right? And then so the investment that you put in your people will return to you tenfold because they trust you. Um, and, and really, that's really what the $64,000 question is all about. Is, is being humble and, and knowing that no matter what position you rise to, even if you're the number one, if you're the CEO, the president, chairman of the board, guess what? You're not doing it all along. There's a whole slew of people right behind you that are looking for that direction. And at the end of the day, if they don't feel you value them, you're done. It's over, right? Your company will fold um, or, or they'll move on from you. They'll cut it off. You know what I mean? So, it's just don't get too big in your own head at the end of the day. Yeah, you know, and it's surprising, Rob, with you with you saying that too. How that still is an issue in some places, in some industries, in some legacy organizations where the leaders just aren't willing to change themselves first. And I think that's where they're on the route to failure. Um, it's worth repeating, I think, some of these things that you talked about there as a as a little summary, if you don't mind, because you started by talking about the the you know the the whole is greater than the few or the one nobody does it alone that diversity of skills uh direction of action those are the things that make a difference um and the the duty of care of leaders which i loved what you put is is to create that safe space where people can flourish they can feel that they can make um contributions without uh, necessarily being admonished where they can thrive within that as well and that takes collaborative leadership it takes humble leadership as you talked about as well um, and it takes a great deal of flexibility at the time as well um, and once you've got all of that in place and then you can show as you pointed out that you value the people by you're walking the talk not just talking the talk you're there with them you're supporting them um, you're supporting them through the tough times, the rough times, as much as celebrating the good. I think that's what ultimately starts to create that very, very strong platform of, of, of trust. So thank you so much for sharing all of this, Rob. It's been such an insightful session, and I'm absolutely sure many tuning in will want to get in touch with you. So how do people connect with you to continue the discussion, Rob? Well, uh, there's a couple of different ways. Um, so my work email address is Robert dot appleton at troopers.ny.gov personally uh you know i i'm an adjunct professor for marist college in the school of management there for those getting their graduate degrees in in uh the master's in public administration department that's where i am uh, so i have an email address there as well um you know and uh linkedin i have a linkedin profile and more than happy to 
uh, send me an invite. I'll take a look at you to see if there's something that we mesh, and then you know we'll we'll build a relationship from there. Um, and I look forward to the opportunity and, and you know having discussions with anybody who wants to talk about leadership and decision making because it's something that I study an awful lot because I'm trying to improve. Um, I'm not the best. I'm trying to be the best. Uh, but I know I'm not there yet. There's something I learn every single day and, and having an opportunity to talk with you and anybody else who is willing to talk about these things, because at the end of the day, we're tasked with getting it right. And that's what we want to do is we want to get it right. And um, because people are counting on us. And the last thing you want to do is disappoint somebody. That's in Robert Appleton. Rob, thank you so much for joining me. It's been a real pleasure. I can't wait to get this episode out there. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time, sir. I really appreciate it. It's awesome. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Rethink Leadership Podcast with me, Jeremy Blaine. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel or simply go to performanceworks.global to access all the episodes to date. We'll see you next time.